Hello and welcome to Bentley Baptist Church's online service. My name's Ruth and it's my privilege to guide you through this service today. Shortly we'll be having a time of sun worship, after which Andrew will lead us through communion. So if you're not already prepared for that, now would be a good opportunity to get some bread or a cracker and some juice or wine. After communion, Joel is going to be continuing in our series on Acts. And to today, he'll be speaking from Peter's sermon to the crowds following the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But before we lift our voices in praise and worship, I'll just pray for us. Father God, we thank you this morning that you are here, you are with us, and you want to work amongst us. And so this morning, we lift your name on high. We give you praise and glory. We worship you, for you alone are worthy. As we lift our voices to you, may you receive our praise and glory, and may your name be exalted. Thank you, Father. Amen.
welcome to that part of our service where we take communion together. If you're not prepared for that, then why not just hit the pause button, shoot off and get some bread um, and some juice or wine so that we can share all together. The fact that we're sharing in our homes doesn't make communion any less significant or important. The fact is that we are all one body in Christ. It says in Corinthians, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. God, we thank you that this bread represents the body of Jesus Christ, the bread of life. We thank you that Christ lives in us and through us, the body of Christ, a family of believers, your church. And now we receive this bread as the body of Jesus Christ broken for us. So we eat the bread together. God, we give you thanks for this wine and we ask you to bless it as a symbol of Christ's blood shed for the remission of our sins. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, your only Son, who died for us, washing us clean and bringing us peace with you. We have eaten the bread, and now together we drink the wine, all in remembrance of you. We remember that Jesus gave his life for us and for the whole world. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us Christ's saving body and blood. May this same Spirit live in us that we might cherish and share Christ's sacrificial and healing love with everyone. Lord, Jesus, Holy Spirit, be with us today and the rest of this week as we go forwards. Thank you that we can remember you in this way. Amen.
Hi folks, I'm Joel. I'm the minister here at Bentley Baptist Church and let me kick off this uh, message today by asking you a question. Are you good at listening to instructions and obeying those instructions? Sometimes as humans we get a bit resistant when people try and tell us what to do and how we should do things. Um, I can uh, think easily of the example of my children. I might have given them an instruction about something that they don't really want to do. And so they've not listened to it. And when I ask them later, they've not obeyed the instruction. I can also refer that back to myself. Maybe my wife has been talking to me about something coming up in the week and I'm just not that fussed about it. And so if I'm honest, I haven't really engaged with what she was saying. I haven't really listened properly, which means I'm not going to be able to obey the instructions. And what if it's something really important? What if, if, if it's something really significant that we've just chosen not to pay attention to? The world's full of people trying to give us advice and tell us about the, the way to live life. You know, what's going to make a difference to your life? But often these are conflicting instructions as well, things you might see online, things you might read in different books by people. Well, today uh, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, uh, at a speech that a guy called Peter gives to a crowd of people and they want to hear him. You know, they, they're not listening because he's forcing it on them, but actually they've seen something incredible. Uh, the people who are there have heard the disciples of Jesus speaking all of these different languages because they've been filled with the power of God's Holy Spirit. And they gather uh, around the disciples who are speaking in all of these different languages and they ask, you know, what is going on here? Uh, some of them are amazed. Some of them think that the disciples are just drunk. Well, let's get into uh, this, this passage. This is Acts chapter 2. And we're starting at verse 14. OK, here we go. Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you think. It's only nine in the morning. No. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And this is a quote from the Old Testament. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And then it says in verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, continues Peter, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. 
because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. We're going to skip forward to verse 32 now. It says there, God has raised Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear, that gift of tongues that everyone was listening to. From verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, who you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. Then with many other words, Peter warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Then those who accepted the message were baptised. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 new followers of Jesus were saved. They were baptised. And then we believe they received the Holy Spirit. After hearing about the good news of Jesus and witnessing the power of the Holy Spirit, the crowd had asked uh, asked Peter what they should do. And Peter gives them three instructions. We're going to explore those three things uh, over the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, And the first instruction was they need to be saved. Secondly, they need to be baptised. And thirdly, they need to receive the Holy Spirit. So the first thing, the first instruction from Peter to the crowd back then, and just as important for us, is We need to be saved. People need to be saved. In Acts 2, 38, Peter says, repent and be baptised. Repent means turn away from your old way and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Peter outlines to this crowd that we, as human beings, have a problem, a sickness, a fatal disease called sin. And sin is, it's essentially anything we say, think or do that is the opposite of God's ideal for for our lives, God's best for us, God's purpose for us, God's dream of the best that humans can be. Anything that's not God's best is sin. Now, Some of us think that if we can balance out some of the bad, sketchy things we've done, some of the sins with loads and loads of good stuff, loads of positivity, loads of love in our lives, that that actually we can stand before God and on balance we'll be okay. God will judge us and be like, you know what, most of it was cool. We'll overlook the few little bad things. You come on in, you're welcome to eternity. But, but actually, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. In Ezekiel chapter 18, 24, in the Old Testament, it says, if righteous people, people who are doing the right thing, turn from their righteous behaviour and start doing sinful things and act like any other sinner, should they be allowed to live? No, of course not. All their righteous acts will be forgotten and they will die for their sins. Do you hear that? Just one sin in our lives writes off any amount of good we've ever done. And it results in us being separated from God for eternity. Romans 8.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all messed up. And then Romans 6.23 tells us the consequence of falling short of God's glory, of God's standard. It says the wages of sin is death. 
And it's not just saying we'll die one day because we, we know that we know human bodies right now and we're all going to die. It's saying an eternal darkness, an eternal separation from God. You will be gone. Your existence will be finished. The wages of sin is destruction. It's destruction. But then Romans 6.23, the second part of that verse says, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we need to be saved and we've discovered that Jesus is the answer. He's the one that can save us through his death on the cross. But, but I don't know about you, but when I was a younger Christian, I, I had some questions about this. Because if God is all powerful, why did Jesus need to die for us to be forgiven? Couldn't God just choose to do it? Why couldn't God just say, ah, I'll, I'll just forgive them. I don't need to destroy them for their sin. I'll forgive the sin and everything will be fine. Why did Jesus have to die for that to happen? Well, to understand this, we have to look closely at the character of God. We have to understand properly who God is. See, a lot of the time in our, in our culture, in our society today, um, people tend to have this idea of God as this like uber being. He's just all powerful and that's who God is. Some great unknowable architect of fate. But that's not how he revealed himself in the Bible. It's not what the Bible says about the most important aspects of God's identity. And as we understand God's identity, we start to understand why Jesus had to die. OK, so check this out. Uh, it says in Psalm 101 verse 1, I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord, I will sing praise. Then in Psalm 89, verse 14, it says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Do you hear the commonalities here? Love and justice. And then in Exodus 34, 6 to 7, God describes himself to Moses. God reveals himself to Moses and he goes through this long list of characteristics about who he is. But they can be summed up by saying he is utterly gracious and utterly just. He's perfect love and he's perfect justice. So the best way to understand God's identity is through these, these traits that are spoken of throughout the Bible about who God is. He is unchanging, perfect love and justice. God, uh, when he's asked by Moses what his name is, he says Yahweh. And the name of God translates to I am who I am or I am who I'll be. God's name is I'm just who I am. So essentially, God's own name tells us he cannot be anybody except who he is. So if God is perfect love and perfect justice, he can never be anything else. Now, God's perfect righteousness and justice, God's perfect justice, it means that when he witnesses sin, when sin, when wrongdoing, when evil exists, God can't let it go unpunished and sin can't be near him without being destroyed because of his perfection. God's perfect justice means that because we're the source of sin, because we're the origin of rebellion, because we are the origin of pain and suffering in human existence, God, if he's perfectly just, he should get rid of us to get rid of sin. That's just his character. God doesn't want anything evil because he's so perfectly good and just. And so he should destroy humanity. But God loves us so much. Throughout the Old Testament, we read that God created human beings in his image because he wanted us 
He wanted to have these children that he created that could know him, that where he could love us and we could learn to love him. And and as we read through the Bible, we discover that God has made promises to humanity to be our God, to bless us and to save us from the mess that we make for ourselves. So to be true to who he is, perfectly just and perfectly loving, God must simultaneously destroy us, the source of sin, to get rid of sin, and he must save us because he loves us. How can he do both of those things? How can God destroy us because we're the source of sin, but save us because of his love? The author C.S. Lewis wrote, it's no more possible for God than for the weakest of his creatures to carry out both of two mutually exclusive alternatives. Not because his power meets an obstacle, but because nonsense remains nonsense, even when we talk it about God. Just as I can't walk in two different directions at the same time to suggest that would be nonsense, so God cannot both destroy and save sinful humans at the same time. It's just nonsense. You can't save and destroy something at the same time. God cannot do it. But as Peter tells the crowd, God has a deliberate plan to solve the internal tension of his own perfection. The answer is found in a prophecy in Isaiah 16 verse 5 in the Old Testament. It says, in love a throne will be established. In faithfulness a man will sit on it, one from the house of David, one who in judging seeks justice and speeds the cause of of righteousness. It's talking about Jesus, God the Son. He's the one who fulfilled this prophecy of the one who would bring together God's love and justice for humanity. God himself, he enters the world, God the Son enters the world as a man called Jesus and he experiences everything it is to be human but he never commits a sin, he never messes up, he's never selfish, he never ever does something that is in opposition to God's best for the human race. And because Jesus is completely human, the Bible says fully man, He can be a representative for humanity. He can take the consequences of our sins upon himself and choose to die to satisfy the demands of perfect justice and righteousness. There is a death that disposes of the sinful nature of humanity. The price is paid. But because Jesus is also fully God and has never committed a sin in his existence. He is not bound by the wages of sin. He is not bound by death and he can return to life. Not just to deal with that whole sin problem, but to give us an incredible eternal gift. Check this out. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin, to be sin for us. So Jesus becomes our sinfulness. But then it continues. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus swaps our sins for his perfection. This is often called the divine exchange. So now, what do we need to do to receive this righteousness, to receive the eternal life that comes with it? Well, Peter tells the crowd, he says, call on the name of the Lord. Romans 3, 22 to 24, it says that this this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
If you want to be saved by Jesus today, all you need to do is believe in him and call on his name. Ask him to do it. You say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Will you save me? And that's it. He does it. He will do it. He will invite you to be his friend in in eternity. But what if we mess up again? What if we've been saved and then we commit more sin and we mess up? Because let's face it, we're going to, aren't we? What if we sin again? Well, 1 John 5, 11 and 18 says this. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe and the evil one cannot harm them. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of hope to the world that once we are in him, we are no longer sinful beings. We are beings of righteousness and not just human low standards of of rightness and goodness. We are the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. John 3, 16 to 17 puts it beautifully. This is how God loves the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So that's the first instruction that Peter gives to the crowd. He says, you need to be saved and we still need to be saved today. If you've never been saved by Jesus, if you've never surrendered your life and your will to Jesus, he needs to save you because of the reasons that I've just laid out. That God in his infinite love wants to hold you and love you and draw you close, but in his infinite justice cannot allow evil to be perpetuated in this world. Jesus needs to make you right. He needs to do it or we'll never be right ourselves. That's the first thing. Peter said you need to be saved. The second thing that Peter said we need to do is to be baptised. Why? Well, baptism, the act of baptism, to be dunked underwater uh, and, and come up from that water in a ritual, in a ceremonial way. It's a symbol of what Jesus has done for us. It's a symbol of the fact that he's washed us clean of sin, that he's given us a reborn new life. And doing it publicly shows everyone that we are now a follower of Jesus and we're going to live a different life. It'd be easy to just become a Christian and then get on with our old lives. But through baptism, we are challenged to make a physical change the way we live, living in a different way, in imitation of Jesus because of what he's done for us. Baptism is our declaration that we will live differently from this day forward. It is not optional for Christians to get baptised. It is an essential to help us in that journey and in that commitment to Jesus. You need to be saved by Jesus. And we need to be baptised into the church to display that commitment to Jesus. Those are the first two things. The third thing that Peter says we need to do, the third instruction he gives in response to what Jesus has done for us is that we need to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, you've been saved. If, if you've been saved by Jesus, uh, by the power of Jesus, and you've shown everyone that you want to live a different life through baptism, well, that's amazing. But actually living for Jesus is really hard. Doing miraculous things for Jesus is hard. In fact, for humans on our own, it's impossible. You cannot do miraculous things without the power of the Holy Spirit. Changing the world to be more like heaven and less like hell with our, you know, charitable actions, it's really hard because sometimes we just don't feel like it. And some of us, do you know what? Some of us, we, we, we might be carrying pain 
that is holding us back from the purpose God has for us, that God wants to heal by filling us with his Holy Spirit. The author Rob Bell writes, it's one thing to be saved, but it's another to be healed. It's possible to be saved and still be miserable. It is possible to be saved and not to be a healthy, whole, life-giving person. It is possible for the cross of Jesus to have done something for a person but still not in them. And so Jesus sends us the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who believe, to, to empower us, to equip us, to give us gifts, supernatural abilities, to give us joy and peace and healing. But though we all receive the Holy Spirit when we become a Christian, we actually need to continually seek to be filled we can be saved, we can be baptised, we can have received the Holy Spirit, but we need to go on being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, the Bible says that the same group of disciples who were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 needed to be filled again in Acts chapter 4. In Ephesians 5.18, uh, the Apostle um, Paul writes to the Christians in Ephesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's writing to Christians who have received the Holy Spirit to be filled. And in the original Greek, the, the wording about being filled, it's not be filled once. It's keep being filled, be filled and be filled and be filled like a like a, a recharging a battery, like refilling an empty cup. And finally, in Acts chapter 8, we discover that not all Christians are filled with the Holy Spirit when they're saved by Jesus. It says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that people in Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they'd only been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. The people were saved and they were baptised, but they'd not yet been filled with the Holy Spirit. And do you see how they received the Holy Spirit in that message, in that passage, sorry, the, the apostles, they laid hands, they put their hands on them to pray. And as they prayed with hands laid on, the Holy Spirit came and filled the believers. Peter gave the crowd three instructions when the Holy Spirit first came. And I believe we have to follow those same three instructions today. Where are you at? Do you need to be saved? Just give your life to Jesus right now. Let us know. Put something in the comments. Message us if you've given your life to Jesus during this message today. We want to know. We want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. Maybe you're saved, but you've not been baptised. Maybe you need to make that public statement that you are a different person. Or maybe you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've been filled before, but you're feeling a little bit empty, a little bit dry of God's power and purpose for your life. We'd love to pray for you. But as it says in the Bible, it, it's a really good way to do it by laying on hands. We, we'd be happy if, if you're within range to even come to you and pray for you for the, for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let me pray now as we end this message this morning. Lord, I thank you that you want to save us. I thank you that even though we can be broken and we can be hurtful and we can be selfish and unkind, you still love us immeasurably and you died to save us. I want to ask, Lord God, that you would help those of us who are baptised to remember our baptism and to live by the vows we made on that day to follow you. And if we've not been baptised, Lord, give us the courage to do it. 
And if we need to be refilled with your Holy Spirit today, Lord Jesus, I pray that right now, whether we're laying on hands or not, you would fill us with your presence, with your power, with your authority, with your spirit. Lord, just fill your people right now so that we can be and do all that you call us to. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who saves us. Amen. Thank you, Joel, for that word. I pray that each one of us this morning will have received from God in order that we might be able to pass that on to those we meet this week. If you have any questions arising from today's service or if you would like to share a testimony, please get in touch via our website or through social media where you'll also be able to find out more about what's going on in the life of the church. So until next week, when I hope you'll be able to join us again, I just pray God's blessing on you. Amen.